I have to say, I think you probably have the, the crappiest company in the world. One of my co-founders, Tim, he and I met playing poker. I told him, you know, do you have any companies that are bad ideas that you would love to start? He goes, I want to measure your poop. And I was like, that is hilarious. One of our friends was like, have you guys thought about smart toilets? And we we're like, you know, we've named the company, but we haven't explored the concept in any degree of sincerity. And he was like, you might think about it. We pretty quickly realized like, wow, there is so much more interesting data here than I think we'd appreciated. And it's actually quite relevant to an incredibly large portion of the population. It is one of the most overlooked, but probably proportionally most valuable data that we have. If you catch colorectal cancer in like year three, four or five of its development, as opposed to if you were able to identify it in its very earliest stages, passively, I think that's where the life-saving potential comes in here. It's one of those things like, it's crazy to me that this exists for like your animals, but not for you. Scott, welcome to the Ken's Nearest Neighbors podcast. I came across your company. We, we ran into each other in passing and I heard about what you do. And I have to say, I think you probably have the, the crappiest company in the world. Um, but I absolutely love it. And I, I, I had to have you on to talk about it. Thank you so much again for coming on. No, thank you so much for the compliment. I really appreciate it. <laughs> and I couldn't agree more. I, my, my Twitter bio uh, claims that I'm the world's crappiest founder. So, well, so for, for those that don't know, could you explain a little bit about your work? And then maybe we'll get into some of the backstory of how that all came across. Because yeah. I, I don't want to bury, bury the, the lead here. We might as well just jump straight into it. Yes, yeah, so we're building a device that monitors gut health, urological function, and hydration from your toilet. So what are the practical implications of that? So a lot of things, right? I think the first is particularly relevant to people that have a chronic condition that manifests in urological or gut health symptoms. Um, so on the urological side, we monitor hydration. It's baffling to me that there's not a device today that tells you how hydrated you are. Uh, there's a couple that are like very performance athletics oriented, which I'm sure you're aware of, you know, these sweat patches, but most Americans are not, you know, working not out the requisite 30 minutes a day it takes to build up the sweat that you would need to monitor your hydration. And it's also just not that relevant for day-to-day -day life and, you know, just general health and wellness monitoring. That's more of a, like I said, performance athletics concern. So, but there are certain populations for whom hydration is actually highly relevant, right? So, uh, people with chronic kidney disease is one, particularly those with like end-stage renal failure. The big danger there is being dehydrated is obviously not good, but uh, as your kidneys go, um, being what they call like fluid overloaded, it can be equally damaging. So maintaining like the right hydration balance is important. Um, and then seniors is the other big population. So as you age, your thirst response becomes diminished. You're not as aware as when you're thirsty, so you drink don't drink enough water. This leads to walking around chronically dehydrated. Uh, chronic dehydration is one of the leading risk factors associated with accidental falls. And as Peter Atia has talked a lot about, accidental falls are uh, the single largest cause of accidental death in seniors, fall, falls and complications due to falls. So just like even preventatively, proactively monitoring your hydration in old age can be like quite beneficial. Um, and so that's all kind of, and then the other big pieces on the urological side, I, I should back up is also um, monitoring things like peak flow rate. Um, so 50% of men by the time they reach 50 and 80% of men by the time they reach 70 will have some degree of benign prostatic hyperplasia. So that's non-cancerous enlargement of the prostate. So that, that just basically means your prostate is impinging your urethra, making it harder to void. Um, it's like the fancy medical term for pee. Um, and tracking your peak flow rate is one of the best ways to monitor the progression of that condition. And there's, again, nothing today that gives people any insight on that outside of going to the urologist. And so I'm, I'm a big believer in, you know, you know, I'm sure we'll talk about this, but, you know, like ongoing monitoring. And so that's, you know, all the benefits on the, you know, left side of the equation, I consider, you know, the, the urological side. And then on the stool side, gut health, there's just basic gut health monitoring, right? So, um, you know, my background is mechanical engineering undergrad, and I think of the human body as a system. And so, you know, if you just look at the outputs and the system's outputs are healthy, the system is probably performing pretty good. If you look at the outputs and the outputs are not healthy, um, then that tells you either you look at the inputs or something's wrong with the system and the way it's processing the inputs. And so on the gut health side, we monitor what's called the Bristol stool scale. Um, so basically just have an AI looking at each of your stools and grading it on the stool scale from one to seven, where one is like constipative and seven is diuretic, and then three and four in the middle are considered healthy. Um, 
and that's a proxy for gut health. The other is measuring your digestive transit time, so how long it takes you to process food end to end. Um, and then you can start to do cool things like overlay, uh, you know, foods you eat, medications and supplements you take, and correlate based on your digestive transit time, like how those inputs affect your outputs, and get a view, you know, triangulating on like what is good and bad for your gut specifically. Um, and then finally, kind of the North Star for us is looking for stool or, or blood in stool. So a lot of things can cause blood in stool, um, you know, fissures, fistulas, hemorrhoids, viral infections, ulcers. The scariest of them all is colorectal cancer. Um, you know, there's been a lot of articles about this in mainstream media in the past, you know, six months, but like the, the rate and incidence of color, colorectal cancer across the country is on the rise. Um, like significantly, if you're born in 1990 or after, then compared to someone born in 1950, you're four times more likely to have colon cancer and maybe it's twice as likely to have colon cancer and four times more likely rectal cancer. And it's, anyways, it's, you know, it's one or the other, <laughs> but point is, um, one of the earliest manifestations of colorectal cancer is in fecal occult blood. So that's blood that you cannot see with the naked eye. You know, that's the occult part of it. Um, and so looking for that with multispectral imaging and, you know, basically identifying, you know, early signs of blood, that's not enough to be diagnostic, right? That's just enough to throw up a red flag. And that's kind of our goal. We don't want to make diagnoses. We're a health and wellness device, not a medical device. Um, and, you know, candidly, blood detection is not something we'll be doing in the next year, but that's our North Star because I think there is very much a world in which one day, you know, somebody gets a red flag from their device and says, hey, you know, you have, you know, something to be concerned about. You should probably go talk to a GI doc. They go get a colonoscopy and discover that they have, you know, precancerous polyps or early stage colorectal cancer, you know, before it's metastasized. And you can, I think that person could legitimately be able to say, you know, my toilet saved my life. And that's a pretty amazing, that would be you incredible. know, that's, that's the vision. Well, so correct me if I'm wrong. It seems here the large vision is at least in the short term, we can track everything that goes into your toilet. Mm -hmm. We can more broadly connect that to what you're doing in the real world. And with that information, that data, we can hopefully longer term help to earlier evaluate when you should see a professional if something's going wrong, help you to optimize perhaps uh, like your hydration or some of these other things when they're not going correctly. Yeah. Is that that's like and, and your diet. Yeah, perfect. I mean, we're, we talked a lot offline about uh, gut health or gut microbiome. And to me, it's really interesting. It seems like you're in a specific area where, frankly, there isn't a ton of data across multiple people across this huge spectrum. And how can we create solutions without that that data being readily available? I mean, it's pretty hard to get that data. And I, I love that, you know, first and foremost, it seems like what you're doing is creating a data collection company. Mm -hmm. And then you can move on to be creating a prediction company or any of these types of things in the future. But we need that data to begin with, right? It's so funny. You're like that you're exactly right. And one of the, the things I'm excited about, and you, you know, we're not there yet, but I, I have this idea of, you know, if, if you've ever done, you know, Facebook advertising, there's this idea of a lookalike audience, right? Which is, uh, you know, advertise or show this ad to other people that like products like this, right? And I have this theory that, well, you know, when we have enough devices in the wild and enough people logging their meals, that we will we'll be able to identify lookalike guts, right? And so, you know, based on what we've seen off your gut and how you respond to certain foods and medications and supplements, what we've seen other people who responded similarly, what we have seen work for other people who have responded similarly are X, Y, and Z. Very true. Well, it's funny because you're on Ken's Nearest Neighbors podcast and K Nearest Neighbors is probably one of the main algorithms for a lookalike or any of those types of things. I love that. Yeah. <laughs> very, very subtle, subtle connections. I also can't go without making the date, the, the, the joke that you probably have the shittiest data uh, of any company out there. <laughs> it's, it's, <laughs> quite, yeah. quite literally. Well, let, let's rewind a little bit. I'm interested in how this even became remotely a thing. I, I don't think most of us started with our first company idea being like, let's track poop and pee and make it useful to to so many people and be like, because it is one of the most overlooked, but probably proportionally most valuable data that we have, because it is, we, we have a ton of inputs and very few outputs respectively. Yep. 
Um, can you just rewind for me and tell me how did, how did this all start? Is there like a sick origin story? A joke. <laughs> Honestly. So my, one of my co-founders, Tim, he and I met playing poker now three and a half years ago, um, became fast friends. And at a poker game one time, I had pitched him an idea for a company that I was convinced was a terrible idea, but would inevitably become a you know billion dollar company. And I told him, you know, do you have any companies that are bad ideas that you would love to start? He goes, I want to measure your poop. And I was like, that is hilarious. I totally get it. Like there's this, you know, this urge to quantify things, right? It's like it's a very human drive. And I told him, you know, on the spot, I was like, dude, that is hilarious. You should name it Throne. You would sell to leader or you would put a leaderboard on it and sell it into frat houses. <laughs> and like that was the joke. And we joked about this Throne concept for like two and a half years. We were working together at our previous company. Um, I had joined another startup and recruited him with me. And we kind of treated that as like the dating before marriage as co-founders. We knew we wanted to start something together. But we were, you know, being very intentional about what that thing was. Throne was not in the conversation. <laughs> we we both come from medical families. Both my parents are medical doctors. Tim's mom's a nurse and he has like three sisters that are nurses. And so we both grew up in these medical households and we're both very motivated by the real life impact of working in healthcare. Um, it's just, I don't think there's another industry where your direct impact is like so obviously like positive <laughs> if you're doing it right. And so we were looking at healthcare ideas, um, originally looked into something in the healthcare staffing world, pretty quickly decided that wasn't it. So then we went back to the drawing board and Throne kept coming up, but we were not taking it seriously, right? We had like a whole like, you know, Kanban of different ideas we were looking at and, you know, like two star, you know, in exploration and then like, you know, trash. And we kept moving things right across the board. Throne wasn't even on the board. And finally, uh, one of our friends was like, have you guys thought about smart toilets? And we we're like, you know, we've named the company, but we haven't explored the concept in any degree of sincerity. And he was like, you might think about it. And so we uh, called some, you know, health care practitioner friends of ours. And we're like, is there any medical utility to this? Right? Like, you know, this is, I gave that spiel at the beginning of, you know, what is the practical uses for monitoring your waste? And like all of that, I knew nothing about that a year ago. And talking to gastroenterologists and urologists and, uh, you know, gerontologists and primary care pr providers and nutritionists and dietitians, we pretty quickly realized like, wow, there is so much more interesting data here than I think we'd appreciated. Uh, and it's actually quite relevant to an incredibly large portion of the population. You know, roughly 60% of the country has some chronic condition. Um, and a lot of those are neurological or gastrointestinal in nature. It, to me, that is, well, it's so fascinating because it, it makes sense in the broader scheme of things, right? We're looking at, you know, a, a whoop or an aura ring where we're constantly tracking things. And part of the benefit is, oh, it's, it's easy to track these things and I don't have to think about it. I just wear this totally. thing and go through it. And it gets harder as we start to try to track things that are less pleasant to track. I remember... I had some some gut issues. I had my gallbladder removed and I had to submit stool samples. Talk about the worst possible experience ever. I, I say that all the time. It's the worst. It's the literal worst user experience yeah. in the world. I mean, yeah. you know, outside of like surgery. Yeah. And, and to me, just thinking about that, it's like, well, could we have maybe lower fidelity data, but over a long period of time, and could that tell a better story that I wouldn't even have to worry about? You know, could it be a Fitbit? Could it be a Whoop? Could it be one of these types of things that is sort of part of natural life and it just collects the data for you? And it it seems like you fulfilled that need, but in a very difficult to collect space, which I think has a ton of utility because, you know, the harder data is to collect, the more valuable it in theory can be because of the scarcity side it if the data is useful. Yeah. Yeah. So, so something else we haven't touched on, but we should probably talk about is like the nature of the device, which is a, yeah, it's a camera that goes in your toilet. And like, that is a crazy concept. And that was like one of the first things that gave us pause when we sat down this route, right? Which is like, okay, so there's obviously useful data to collect in your waste. What are the different ways you would collect that data? Right. And uh, I think the, 
at the very highest level, we kind of delineated between contact measurement and non-contact measurement. And there's a lot of things you can do with contact measurement, right? Like measuring specific concentrations of metabolites in your urine, um, you know, the stool sample you're talking about collecting, that would be considered a contact measurement. And there's lots of companies that will do like these kind of gut microbiome tests where you collect a stool sample and bag it up in a little vial and ship it back. And then a couple of weeks later, you get, you know, your microbiome data back. Um, by and large, contact measurement is A, a solved problem and B, just like not very user friendly. People don't like it. You know, you, you can, there was a tweet that went viral yesterday that probably 50 people sent me that was a, a urinal in China that you can pay like $3 on WeChat to quantify the health of your pee. And it just goes through and tells you, you know, here's different 10 different biomarkers we're looking at, you know, bilirubin and protein and your pH, et cetera. And we've looked down that route and that they're basically using chemical paper reaction strip assays. Um, and so anyways, long story short, like there, there's ways you can do that today, right? And you can take that same test today from Amazon for 70 cents a test. Problem is there's like 50% chance higher than that that you're going to pee on your hand. <laughs> like people don't want to do that unless you have like a chronic condition that almost demands that you do that, right? Then there's the non-contact measurement route. And so you're limited in like the types of things you can do for non-contact measurement, right? Like what are non-contact sensors? They're microphones, they're cameras, there's you know, spectroscopy, um, optical, but like, that's kind of the world you're playing in. And we we're like, very concerned that people would not want to put a camera in their toilet. So one of the first things we did back when we were still evaluating the concept is we went and stood outside of Trader Joe's here in Austin and you know, assaulted, you know, 15 different random strangers walking down the sidewalk. Uh, assault is the wrong word, but you, you get what I mean, right? Um, but basically just, you know, ask them, hey, can we ask you a few questions? And, you know, we kind of let in, right? Like, you know, if you could monitor health information from your waist, would that be interesting? And if they said yes, we continue talking. And then finally we asked, you know, given that you're interested in monitoring, you know, health from your waist and hyd hydration is a big one, right? Like everyone's curious to know their hydration and it's so relevant to just how you feel on a day-to-day -day basis, right? And like half the morning you wake up and you're groggy and it's just because nothing you did the day before other than you just didn't drink enough water before bed. So long story short, we would ask them, like, would it be offensive to you to put a camera in your toilet? Granted that it's pointing down and not up and it's not looking at body parts. There's nothing useful there to us. That's only a liability. We just want to see what's in the toilet. Every single person said, yeah, go for it. I don't mind at all. One person asked to invest. And that's when we kind of looked at each other. We were like, what? <laughs> so I take a step back, right? So we're asking people to put cameras in their toilets, but it's not the most off-putting idea in the world, it turns out, right? When you qualify it as only downward facing, and it allows you to collect a data source that like, I think a lot of people have started down this path. And it's very easy to convince yourself that it's not going to work unless you kind of push through the awkwardness. This episode of Cat Zero's Neighbors is brought to you by Z by HP. HP's high compute, workstation grade, a lot of products and solutions. Z is specifically made for high performance data science solutions and I personally use the ZBook Studio and the Z8 workstation. I really love that the Z workstations can come standard with Linux or WSL2, and they can be configured with the Data Science Software Stack Manager. With the Software Stack Manager, you can get right to the work of doing data science on day one without the overhead of having to completely reconfigure your new machine. Now back to our show. Well, you think about any of the other fitness tracking type stuff. We're giving away our heart rate data, mm -hmm. our heart rate variability data, our skin temperature, whatever the hell any of these types of things are measuring to some company to begin with. And we're trusting that they'll do something useful with it. But in return, we get diagnostic on our health, we get a recovery score, we get to see how we sleep, we get all these different things. And for everyone, it is a trade off to say, Oh, okay, I do have to give up some privacy to reap the benefits. And I, obviously, I trust that you're, you know, that the that the camera is doing the correct thing and pointing yep. down and doing whatever it might be. To me, that's that's the natural trade off we make. If 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 you were to say, oh, Ken, you have uh, we we're putting a camera in your toilet and it's even facing up, but I'll add ten years of extra healthy life mm. uh, to 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 the the end of your lifespan. Like, yeah, easy, that's easy so trade off, right? Yeah, like, that, okay, so that's 
to be very clear, we're not. Doing <laughs> yeah, they that. do not do that. <laughs> to be very clear, but but yeah, that's that's a whole that's a very interesting trade off. Like kind of a hilarious thought experiment that I no one has brought up before, and I love that. We're not anywhere close to having that longitudinal data, but and I don't know that pointing a camera up would get you that. But <laughs> but yeah, but I, I think that the idea is you're right. Like people are very open to making trade offs, especially if it's a pretty minimal trade off for them, and it ultimately it melts into the background, right? Like I think. You know, I wear an Aura ring um, and like to your point, you know, I, I think of Aura, Whoop, Levels, Eight Sleep as like, you know, those that have blazed the trail to make Throne a possibility, right? Like I don't think you could have started 10 years ago with Throne, but because these other devices exist and have shown that like, yes, there is a market for personal health and wellness tracking and it is interesting and you know if i don't know if you're a member of any of those subreddits for these companies but like they have super active communities they're always posting screenshots and saying like wow you know like i got the flu yesterday and like look how bad my score is this is amazing or like i had the best sleep of my night yesterday and like look this is amazing like people love seeing their own data quantified and when it's like something that's completely like out of sight out of mind you're not thinking about it right the best thing about aura is i recharge it once a week and the throne device, like same thing. We're targeting battery life of like three months. So you just put it on your toilet, set it, and forget it, and it just passively is giving you this information. That's, I think, super interesting. Oh, inherently. Well, there's so many times in business where this has happened before. You think of, for example, the Kindle, right? The ebook. That was Jeff Bezos's response to iTunes mm -hmm. and Apple essentially doing that exact same concept with music rather than books. And so we see that scale to a bunch of different places. I mean, obviously Spotify took a similar concept and made it so that it was a subscription and that's been continued to iterate forward. But I think that there's absolutely room with same model, but different data that is dramatically harder to collect, that there is a, a, a ton of fruit here. And to me, that also gets us thinking about what the nature of that data is. All of these companies are taking like decent quality uh, diagnostic data over mm -hmm. a long period of time. If you if you wear you know you wear the Aura ring, um, I, I have a couple Aura rings. I actually, just got a Whoop because I can wear that when I train Jiu-Jitsu. Oh, awesome. so I'm going to try and experiment with the other things. But if you look at the quality of that data, it's decent. Yeah. It's it's not super impressive. It's not super specific, but if you have that data every day, it's measuring uh, your heart rate at once every, I think it's like once every hour or something along those yep. lines to, to get enough samples. Then you start to get a very good picture, uh, uh, arguably an even more useful picture than really high fidelity data over a uh, singular time window. Yep. Can you tell me a bit, a bit about like why that longitudinal data is useful uh, maybe from some examples from your experience with Throne or just more broadly? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, I think we talked about this offline, but the, the idea of like high fidelity data captured infrequently versus lower fidelity data captured much more frequently at like a higher sample rate. So before I get to Throne, I'll talk about like another real world example that is kind of emblematic of this to me. So we have a colleague who has a friend who's in his 60s um, who noticed that his resting heart rate jumped from like mid sixties to mid eighties over the course of a month. And he was like, that's a red flag. I don't know what that's about. Went to his primary care physician. His doctor was like, you're getting older. He was like, no, no, no. Like that's a step function change in my heart rate. That is not age. Like, you know, a 20 point jump, you know, 25% increase over the course of a month is that's acute, not chronic. So he went and got a second and third and finally a fourth opinion before a physician looked at it and was like, oh yeah, that's not age, that's something else. Did a full workup and long story short, turns out he'd contracted Lyme disease. Now, the other version of this story would be that he wasn't wearing a continuous you know, heart rate monitor like his Apple Watch and he got his heart rate checked at his annual physical. And if he'd gotten it checked, you know, once in April and then again the next April and saw a 25% increase. Very easy to attribute that to, wow, like, you know, you really just got unhealthier this year, right? You let yourself go and, you know, didn't weren't watching your diet or something. And 
Or we, you climb the stairs coming into here yeah. rather than taking the elevator like last time. Exactly. Right? Exactly. That's a great point because not only is it a change in the trend, but it's also, you know, it's staying at an elevated rate as opposed to, you know, a point in time sample where it's, you're exactly right. Like this is something that comes up a lot in blood testing because like your, your like hormone levels can change so much intraday. Yeah. So, you know, same thing with heart rate, right? Obviously, you know, take the stairs. So it's, would have been very easy to have dismissed like a very serious condition underlying that symptom that he only noticed because he was looking at the charts. Um, so in the world of throne, right? Like we talk about fecal occult blood. I think, you know, again, back to our like North star goal of, you know, monitoring for blood in your stool today. Like if you, first of all, you don't get a, colonoscopy covered by insurance until you're 45. And even then, if you're high risk, you get, I think every three years. And if you're, you know, moderate risk, you get a screening colonoscopy every five to 10. Um, if you catch colorectal cancer in like year three, four or five of its development, that is not a good thing. As opposed to if you were able to identify it in its very earliest stages passively, I, I think that's where the life-saving potential comes in here. So that's, you know, a motivation for us is just right now, no one is looking at this on a daily basis, particularly in the United States. I think, you know, you know, offline you've alluded to culturally, there are differences in mentalities around waste monitoring, right? And like- On oh, China, your example you used before. Yeah, exactly. Right. The, the Chinese, um, you know, urinary biomarker toilet, you know, Germans have a whole toilet design with like a, what they call like a poop shelf. Um, and so just the shape of their toilet, you know, is meant to make it easier to inspect your poop. And that's just not a cultural value in the United States, or at least hasn't been until recently. I think if you look at Google trends in the United States around gut health, um, it's, it's pretty remarkable how much that conversation has gone mainstream in the last five years. Yeah, well, you know, something related to that more broadly in medicine. So you mentioned both your parents are in the medical field. Both my parents are doctors, both of their parents are uh, both my grandfathers are doctors. There's like a lot of pressure on me and I totally <laughs> dropped the ball. But something that, that I observe in them is they're always focused on solving a specific problem. Like something's wrong, we need to fix it. And this current trend of medicine, I, I forget what uh, Dr. Atia calls it. Uh, it's like medicine 3.0 or something mm -hmm. along those lines where we're looking, maybe it's 2.0, 3.0. I digress, but we're looking uh, forward. Yep. And we're trying to predict and trying to prevent it seems like this is directly aligned with that. And it seems like it's it's the it's kind of the intersection of those two things, right? Where, hey, can we prevent things or diagnose things or keep this data so that we can evaluate this as we go? And can we catch something earlier if if it happens? To me, there is just such a magical, I guess, like synergy there. Uh, and that's what medicine hopefully should be. But the problem is that it takes private companies. It takes individuals like yourself that are willing to <laughs> wade through a bunch of shit to get there. There, there. there was another tweet that somebody shared with me earlier this week saying something along the lines of, you know, the future of healthcare is going to be, um, you know, rather than paying for private insurance, you'll pay for, you know, 50 different services that are all very specialized. You know, one's, you know, cardiovascular in nature, one's urological, one's gut health, one's mental health, et cetera. But effectively, you're getting a lot more data points collected on you at all times. And the thing you're paying for isn't peace of mind in the sense that if something goes catastrophically wrong, right, that's that's the peace of mind you get from insurance, right? Is this, you know, disaster <laughs> prevention or not even prevention, just disaster recovery peace of mind um, that instead in the future will be paying for like ongoing peace of mind in the sense that you know you are in a healthy state. And I think that's an interesting vision of the future. I don't necessarily know if I agree with it. I have to think about it some more. But I do think that there's something to that, which is right now, you know, you can monitor your blood glucose in an ongoing way using CGMs. You can monitor, you know, your cardiovascular health. You can monitor now with throne, your hydration, your urological function, your gut health. Um, and like, is it the same degree of fidelity that you would get going in for an annual physical or, you know, something even deeper diagnostic? No, but it is a basic measure of how are you doing today? Yeah. Uh, I, I am firmly of the belief a lot more lower fidelity data over a long period of time, particularly with human health, is almost dramatically better than 
these one shots that that we're describing with oh the hormones is a perfect example i you know i go in fortunately my hormones my testosterone is very good but one time i go in and it's 800 one time i go in it's you know 600 and that's a 200 point difference pretty much no change in the lifestyle except I competed in a jiu-jitsu tournament yep. a couple of days before, which absolutely spikes my testosterone. People don't realize how much, as you mentioned, hormones can change day to day. And you have someone maybe going in after not sleeping, after a lot of things don't go well to get their blood tested, and they're in the 200 range. And it's like, oh, we're going to put this person on TRT that has a lot of different implications um, based on a singular, maybe two tests where they weren't in a normal state beforehand. That to me is is fundamentally fundamentally flawed in in how we approach a lot of this stuff. And and it's interesting to me as a data scientist, someone who's thinking about this as well. You know, I I am always caring about volume, but I'm also caring about volume not just from individuals. I'm mm-hmm. caring about uh, like the depth of volume. I care about big data, mm-hmm. but this is going to go kind of weird, but um, I'm interested because small data is almost more important to you guys. The, this N of one experimentation, which is foreign to me as a data scientist. Can you explain that a little bit more? Yeah. So in, in kind of like fringe healthcare Twitter right now, there's like a, you know, subtle but ongoing waging war or raging war between the randomized controlled trials camp and N of one camp, right? And like the truth is, I think it's probably somewhere in the middle, right? I think like these RCTs do a great job of giving you reference ranges that work for most of the population. That said, the human body is like incredibly complex and you there are, you know, countless health conditions that can affect how you process your environment, the things you put into your body. Um, like, and, and so because each body is so like unique and individual, uh, I do think there's almost like an obligation to understand like how things impact you personally because it might not be the same as what is you know recommended by you know the surgeon general um and that's where n of ones come in is basically testing things and it's actually shocking to me like you know outside of just like fine-tuning and optimizing your health and well-being like even for you know very serious medical conditions a lot of times you know like mental health is pretty well known that you know if you are you know struggling with depression They'll put you on a drug, but they don't know that that's going to be the drug that works for you. And so oftentimes you have to experiment with four or five different drugs before you finally find something that, you know, levels you out and has you feeling yourself. It comes up again with hormones. You know, I have a family member who had a hysterectomy and took probably two years before her hormones were leveled out again. Um, And a lot of it was just trial and error. And so that's what this N of one thing is. Really, it's just a systematic process of trial and error. And that's one of the things I'm most excited about with Throne is empowering people to do kind of like trial and error experiments on their own gut health and have the data to see, you know, in black and white, is this working for me or not? And so, um, you know, in the world of gut health in particular, there's, and, you know, diet, there's dietary allergies, right? Which are, you know, autoimmune responses to foods. Um, And typically, you know, the, the far end of that is like anaphylactic shock or anaphylaxis. And then there's uh, sensitivities and intolerances, and those are more gastrointestinal in nature, right? You're just typically like lacking the proper enzymes and the right concentrations or quantities to digest foods correctly. You can test for dietary allergies with blood te- d- blood draws or like the the skin prick test, where they you know put 15 needles in your arm or your back, and then see you know which ones um, get inflamed much harder to test for sensitivities and intolerances because they are internal to your GI and because they, the degree of sensitivity also changes with the quantity of the food that you eat and then the frequency with which you eat it, right? Like some people can eat a little bit of cheese, but a lot of cheese will like, you know, ruin their next day. Um, And so one of the things I'm super excited about is, you know, now that we'll have this output data, if you want to log your food and we've just gotten to the point in like the last couple of years where like computer vision's gotten to the place where like, you know, food logging should always have been just take a picture of what you're eating and it's like done, right? Like, have you ever used MyFitnessPal? Uh, Or like counting calories? Yeah. yeah. That's, I think that's true of a lot of people, right? Like it's, it's easy to fall off of because 
it used to be just rote data entry, searching for the thing and, you know, trying to like portion it out. It's really time consuming. And when it takes you like two minutes to log a meal, most people are not going to do it. But when it's as quick as like, you know, phone eats first, like, you know, half of us are doing that for Instagram anyway. So one of the things I'm super excited about is like, take a picture of what you eat. And then like over time, we'll tell you, you know, all right, like these ingredients give you, you know, loose stool 60% of the time, right? And like, then you can cut those ingredients out and see what changes. And, you know, and then if you want to log symptoms on top of that, then we can start to even make, you know, correlations into like how your gut's feeling. Um, but yeah, so that, that's kind of the, the core basis of like end, end of one experiments. And like, really it's a service like people today work with like very expensive health coaches and dietitians and nutritionists to do, right? If you have spent any time on like gut health TikTok, I encourage you to, it's really interesting because like basically it's, you know, 500, thousand, I don't know, a lot of, you know, alternative healthcare providers and, uh, you know, but they're licensed and then they all say, you know, here's my top five gut health tips. Don't start there, start here, you know, do X, Y, and Z, not A, B, and C. And kind of my naive take on this at this point is that the primary value that you get from working with a healthcare professional trying to like level set your gut is primarily the accountability of having someone say, here's what the protocol is going to be. We're going to do this experiment for, you know, one or two weeks. And then if we're going to do a check-in and see how you're feeling, and then if that doesn't work, here's the next thing we're going to do. And I think given, and like the, a lot of times they'll ask them to, to take a like manual, you know, like a, a written diary that they call like a stool log and like a, a meal log. And then they'll do, they'll just kind of eyeball those correlations. And I want to make that much more data driven and cheaper. Yeah. Well, I, I love, to me, that is quantifying or making this more scientific. I mean, something that's so problematic in my mind with diet and nutrition and that whole overarching profession is some things work for some people. You know, I'm sure that an all meat diet works great for some people and all uh, a vegan diet works for some people. And I've seen some data and I, please fact check me on this because I might be wrong, but I've seen some data that suggests that your gut microbiome, it adapts to whatever diet that you have. So if you're eating all meat, probably over time, you're going to be, you're going to feel better with an all meat diet because your gut microbiome is seeing this and processing it. And it's like evolving to eat that type of diet, right? If this is the only food we have available, if you think evolutionarily, yep. our bodies will try to adapt and optimize for that type of food. And so you sort of see a lot of these people doing what they feel is correct for their system, but it doesn't necessarily scale. And that's the beauty of collecting data is that we get to see these individual difference these individual differences for ourselves yep. and we get to track what works specifically for us and we can see, okay, yeah, maybe your gut microbiome does change over time, but you have the data to track that. You have the data to be able to understand that. You have the data to say, okay, well, even if it changed, like this specific food still doesn't work for me yeah. and I can just cut it out. Totally. And I mean, this is kind of getting into like the lookalike audience, the thing we we're talking about, right? Which is, you know, okay, so let's say I've been, you know, religious about tracking my meals and I've been using a throne device for a year. Um, and there are, you know, 10,000 people like me, and then you come on and you have, you know, similar intolerances and, you know, respond in a similarly negative way to similar inputs that I did. Like one of the things I'm very excited about is saying, okay, well, instead of going down this, you know, long journey of, you know, this intervention and that intervention and this failed experiment and that ex failed experiment, because Throne knows that you have a gut that looks similar to Scott's. Let's just go ahead and try you on the interventions that we know now work for Scott, right? Like, what does his diet look like? What are the things he's cut out that you were eating that he was reacting badly to, that you're reacting badly to? Like, or, or what are the things he added to his diet, right? What supplements or medications did he, you know, include that he previously didn't? I think that is going to be like such an amazing unlock, right? Just shortcut, like literal decades of suffering for some people. <laughs> well, and that's still big data, right? And, yeah. and that's what I think a lot of people don't realize is that N of one research case study can be uh, big data. It's just used differently. I mean, you mentioned the uh, Amazon recommendations or Netflix recommendations. Mm -hmm. Th those are pretty good for, for a reason because they work. It's just not the traditionally uh, thought of, of, of big aggregated data. You yep. know, when I was talking to uh, Andrew Herr on my other podcast, we talked a bit about how one supplement for someone it can make them feel really good. For another person, it can have no effect. And for uh, a third person, it can make them feel worse or have worse symptoms. 
And if you net that out, how, you know, most like, uh, you know, double blind traditional studies evaluate things, they would just show net no effect. Yeah. Yeah. And hopefully the the statistics and the, and the the data around those are getting a little bit better that they'd be able to tease out that nuance but then that's up to the scientist to be able to determine hey was there any real effect and then it would probably be criticized by other scientists because okay oh like net there is no effect and there's this whole debate um i i'm maybe because i'm a practice like a data science practitioner i always am in favor of hopefully things that could possibly work and are pro will probabilistically work. Like yep. if it's over 51%, I'll probably try it as long as the downside is not bad. Yeah. Right. Because, you know, if, if you have nothing to lose, who cares? I mean, that's one of the other issues largely with science is that if you're not a, a certain level confident in, in the results, we just throw it out, even though like it could be, there's zero downside to this. Why would we not just try it? But it's not statistically significant. We're going to avoid it because uh, of of that like kind of antiquated metric. So it's fascinating to see practical science versus theoretical science uh, come to a head in the world that we live in as well. And like we're squarely in both right now. Yeah. You know, there, there's a lot of cool theory that nobody has put into practice yet. And we're trying to build those tools. I love that so much. Can you talk a little bit about maybe the the application of computer vision like some of you don't have to get nitty gritty yeah. in models or anything along those lines but you know what types of things uh, like how are these models built to evaluate this data yeah um so basically the core process we bootstrapped our first models with was we built you know a couple dozen what we call like alpha imagers um these are basically just like webcams strapped to your toilet that we distributed to friends and family who are like you know down to help the cause. And the other thing that just quick aside is like amazing to me that again, just like one of the, just the joys of working in this space is people that have chronic health conditions are so happy to volunteer to do anything that might help others with a similar condition because they don't like suffering and they empathize so deeply with their peer group who are suffering with it. So it's like been remarkably easy to like, you know, we thought it would be so hard to convince people to put these first cameras in their toilets and like, not at all. So we got, you know, a bunch of cameras and a bunch of toilets, collected a bunch of data, hired a team of physicians uh, abroad to label all the data for us uh, because like that was not a data set that was readily available offline. Shocker. <laughs> yeah. Um, and th those first data sets, and we're patent pending so I can talk about this, but those first data sets basically we allowed us to train a model to first classify what's happening in the toilet, you know, over the duration of a session, right? Like what is the category of each frame? You know, like is is there anything in the toilet bowl in this frame? Is there, you know, number one, number two, toilet paper, foreign objects, um, you know, is the toilet in the process of flushing? Like so so just this longitudinal understanding of like what is happening in each moment of a toilet session. And then from there we can pinpoint the sessions with like the relevant data I put in air quotes, right? And then we zero in on a frame and then the next model is just basically identifying what is happening on a per pixel basis in that frame and identifying, you know, which classes of objects belong to or which pixels belong to which classes of object, I should say. And then the third was, okay, now we've identified like this is a stool. What is that type of stool? And so that's the, the Bristol stool scale model is basically, you know, using computer vision to identify, you know, is this a one, two, three, four, five, six, or seven on the Bristol stool scale? And like, how healthy is that? And then the other is, you know, is this urine? And if so, like how concentrated is it? Um, and, and so those are kind of like the, the foundational like models that we have today. We've got a few more we're building and, you know, we'll talk about those next time. <laughs> uh, heck yes. Also, I hate to burst your bubble, but you're actually not the first and first person who's come on to make a poop classifier. No way. Tell me. Okay. Tell me everything about the My other friend one. Walter, who was a Kaggle Grandmaster, he worked at, I believe it was a company manufacturing diapers, and he made a poop fart classifier to determine if it was a pooping or farting in the diaper. So uh, not it's it's a little different category, but I don't know how this podcast is able to find. That's fascinating. <laughs> it was, so it's so funny. There, I've come across one other company 
that was doing this in the diaper space. Uh, it might have been the same company. Do you remember the name of it, Benny Chin? No, this was, he said he was doing this in like the 90s. So okay, okay. Time. So probably not the same one. Fascinating. Wow, totally. I'll, I'll connect to tool sets. He, Yeah, he, I would he will love to talk to Walter about this. He would love what, love what you're doing. But quick aside. So, so just going to say though, so there's been a couple companies, I guess, that have tried to do this with diapers, right? Like, it, and this is, you know, a theory of mine is that people with children, so parents, are going to be much quicker to grok what we're doing with Throne because one of the only ways kids, like especially like, you know, pre-vocal kids have to communicate about their health is through their poop. Yeah. So interesting. Like, yeah. Anybody who's ever changed a diaper knows that like you look and like see how they're doing. And so I, I have this theory that parents would be much, you know, more responsive or receptive to what we're doing um, for their own health. The other is pet owners. There's a couple companies that do um, basically like urine-based diagnostics for your cat's health in pet litter. And so based on the color that the litter changes. I saw this recently. Yeah. Interesting. It's on Instagram. Like yeah, there's, there's a couple of these. So it's, it's, it's one of those things like it's crazy to me that this exists for like your animals, but not for you. Well, people are willing to spend such crazy things on their animals. I mean, my friend Jack. I think he was working at a company. It was, uh, it was WAG or something like that. It's Fitbit for your dog. Uh, it's pretty, a pretty neat technology, honestly. But it's funny. Like sports and animals, they lead in technology and then humans adopt it. Yeah. So maybe it's also a little bit easier, you know, uh, ethically testing new technologies on animals and things along those lines. Too. Sure. Sure. I mean, and, but, but, but when it comes to waste monitoring, right, there's like no real ethics concerns because no, you're no, not, it's completely not invasive, yeah. right? As, as long as someone consents to having their waste monitored, like, you know, they're a consenting adult. Yeah, a hundred percent. Well, tell me about collecting data as well. So you were telling me that you were asking for some, some pictures on, on Twitter and. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So there, there was one model, uh, another group had developed out of Korea um, that can detect the presence of colonic mucosal inflammation based on a picture of stool. Um, they claim just as accurately as the actual like fecal calprotectin test, which is this test that monitors for this, uh, measures the, the concentration of this protein called calprotectin, which is associated with a inflamed colonic mucosal lining. So um, particularly relevant to people with inflammatory bowel disease, so like Crohn's or ulcerative colitis. And so we were, we were looking at this model and in order to like diligence it, we just needed a lot of stool pictures, um, both healthy and unhealthy to test it against. And going back to what we were talking about, where people who have, you know, unhealthy, you know, chronic conditions are, are just, again, tremendously willing to help out just to further their cause. I, I tweeted, you know, I'm looking for poop pics. Like I'm willing to pay for poop pics. I'll pay you $20 if you have ulcerative colitis or no civil ulcerative colitis. We, we want pictures of your poop. Um, which is like one of the more insane things I've ever had to say in the course of like my career, you know, <laughs> almost <laughs> certainly will be in the thumbnail of this video. I hope that's okay. <laughs> please, please, by all means, um, I, I'll find the tweet and send it to you. But like, we got tremendously positive response, and not a single person accepted payment. They're like, no, like, you know, here's my Google Drive full of my like, you know, horrible, you know, bowel movements. Um, I just hope it's helpful. And like, that was. Uh, again, just like this whole journey is, is like, because I think part of it is because the, the subject matter is just so intimate. Yeah. Like the, the types of interactions you get to have with people are just so like beautiful and like truly like heartwarming, right? Like it's like, never thought getting a poop pic would touch me so. <laughs> well, it's also, I think particularly in those domains, it's very much like mental health where it's not necessarily in the public eye. But you realize like, oh, other people are having these problems. Yes. Other people are going through similar things. I, I mean, I think that there's also a lot of things related to that, especially, you know, with women with like hormonal cycle timing, with birth mm -hmm. control, with a lot of these types of things where it's like, it's kind of taboo to talk about in broader circles. But once you realize there's communities that are dealing with similar problems, you start to realize like, oh my goodness, like, I'm not alone. This isn't just me. This yeah, isn't, yeah. This isn't That's me. absolutely. It's, it's it's an interesting category of conversation because it's not completely taboo, 
but it's not like it's something you talk about weird. in public. Yeah, yeah exactly. It's, it's, it's not over meal. It's not something most people, exactly. It's not something most people post about on their timelines, but it is something that I think a lot of people talk about with their closest inner circle, right? And like, you know, NPR had this whole article that came out a few months ago called Poop Friends, which is like, you know, the friends you talk about your poop with. They're like, that's a real thing, you know? Um, and, you know Democratizing poop friends. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's, yeah, it is a fascinating social phenomenon. And I think also just increasingly, though, it is becoming something that like, I can come on a podcast and talk to you about. Yeah, absolutely. And to me, this is, these are my favorite types of conversations to have. One, like, I think it's fascinating what you're doing. I think, I mean, I let me know how I can get a device because one, I'm very interested in collecting my own data, but two, I, I want to help in any way I can. And also, like, these are fun conversations because I get to learn something totally new. This is a yeah. domain out, outside of my understanding that I get to, we get a riff off of, right? And we get to share with everyone, like, that exact same feeling that you were describing is like, oh, like maybe it's not just me. Like there's other people who are curious about this. There's other people who, um, who might have similar problems and there's a light at the end of the tunnel with, with being able to diagnose and evaluate. I mean, the more data that's collected on anything that is off of the mainstream, the more information we can gather around it. And to me, that's where all of this starts. You can't do the predictive analytics, you can't do the model classification, you can't do any of this without the data first. And it, it gets me so excited that you're getting this whole load of poop data to be able to do this yeah. poop NP data. So I, I, I'm I'm over the moon and um, I, I'd love to be able to help in any way I can. Yeah, amazing. So uh, you asked how to get a device. I'd love to hook you up with one when we have these next version of beta devices ready. We've stopped with the alpha devices just uh, to focus, you know, heads down on getting these beta devices ready. So th those would be the first ones that we could like, you know, ship to anyone in the country and it would be self-installed in a couple of minutes and, you know, actually start running. Uh, the alpha device is like plugged into a wall and most people don't have outlets nearby their toilet. Um, but if anybody else wants one, we have a code um, on our website. So we're thronescience.com. If you go to thronescience.com slash pre-order and use the code KEN40, that'll get you $40 oh, off of yeah. key order or pre-order. I, I will put that in the in the show notes, as well as in the uh, the description on YouTube. That's amazing. Awesome. Yeah. So, um, you know, any of your followers, we'd love to, you know, throw a bone their way. And again, just appreciate anybody who, you know, signs up for the pre-order because you're contributing not only to understanding your own gut health, but again, like, you know, it's kind of groundbreaking in science in its own way. I, I love it. Uh, like water breaking. No, not, not, not the right. Not the right. I tried. I tried. It was not a good look. It was, yeah, it's okay. It's okay. We'll, we'll get the OBGYN device next for the baby monitoring. And then, then we can have the water break. But uh, Scott, again, this was amazing. Um, how can people learn more? How can people connect with you or reach out to you if, if, uh, if they want to learn more as well? Yeah. So, uh, I'm most active on Twitter. So it's just my first name, last name, Scott Hickel. Um, our handle for the company is Throne Science. Our website is thronescience.com. We're about to throw up a blog. Um, go sign up for our wait list so you can pre-order um, for, I think it's $3.99 right now. Uh, that gets you a beta device and also the first GA device when we ship that. So you get kind of two devices for the price of one if you pre-order now. Um, so you get to be one of the earliest testers as well as you'll get you know the, the full-fledged, you know, full-spec device when we ship that next year. Um, but you know, these are kind of low volume manufacturing beta devices, but if you want to participate in that, like there's no way to have more influence over how the development of the device and the software progresses than joining now, because like you'll get, I'll give every single person who signs up for the pre-order, like my personal cell phone number. I want to hear everyone's opinion. Um, that's probably the best way to get in touch with me. And then, yeah, I mean, my Twitter DMS are open. Um, my email is pretty easy to guess if you know our website, <laughs> So, I mean, and I love to talk to anybody and everybody who has anything they'd like to th say in this space, right? Like I want to hear from, you know, people with, you know, chronic gut health conditions. I want to hear from people who are like already taking proactive steps to like better their gut health, right? People who are taking probiotics and eat a lot of, you know, fermented or cultured foods. Like if this is a subject you care about, like I want to talk to you. Heck yes. Are there any questions that you wish I would have asked? but didn't ask her in this podcast? That is a really good question. And 
Honestly, I can't think of a single one right now off the top of my head. We could sit here for probably five minutes and think of one, but you know, you ask a lot of great questions. It's just been a fun conversation. Amazing. Well, I'd love to do this again as you guys continue to evolve. I mean, obviously something I'm passionate about, um, data, health, gut health in particular. So again, really enjoyed this and I can't wait to catch up with you more. Ken, thank you. Yeah, thank you so much.